and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good evening. The Christmas season is among us, coming up on us. And when we stop and think about the Christmas season, everybody talks about the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. But this is a time, too, to reflect and think about Jesus and all that Jesus did for us. You know, Jesus came to this world. He left the splendors of heaven to come to this world, to be born in a manger, to be treated the way he was treated. And he knew he was going to be treated that way for three years. But we know even in his childhood it wasn't treated real well. But even the three years of his preaching, all that he went through to make sure that we could find our way to heaven. And, you know, people say, well, they didn't know who he was. But we, we know from different parts in the Bible they did know who he was. We know the Pharisees knew who he was. We find that in the Gospel account according to St. John in chapter 3. It says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Do we understand how much Jesus really truly loved us and all that he put up with just so that we could find our way to heaven? We can't find our way to heaven without him. But he laid it out so we could be there. Jesus to this day is still the greatest man who ever walked this earth and the greatest one who showed compassion to all people. You know, when people talk about compassion, do you realize the compassion that Jesus showed to all the people? Even to this day, he still shows compassion even to his enemies. He's the greatest man who ever walked this earth. We see it throughout the Bible. We see it in many, many things throughout the Bible. But let's take this time to reflect on a chapter in the Bible that truly reflects a lot of the compassion and the love that Jesus truly had for us. He has, let me rephrase that, has for us even to this day. When we look in the Gospel account, is written by St. John, and we look at this whole chapter, it records a prayer that Jesus offered on the very night that he was betrayed. The very night that he was not only betrayed by all, but that they came and arrested him on charges of things he did not even do. And they took him away to be crucified. We look in John 17. And in the beginning of his prayer, it says, These words spake Jesus as he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. And thou hast given him power over all flesh, and he shall give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Wow. Verses 1 through 5. We well, see that Jesus desires not some kind of earthly recognition that we would think of. He's not looking for any kind of glory on himself. He's looking to glorify the Father in heaven. He's looking to glorify God. This was on his mind. Keep in mind, Jesus shows us in the model prayer. The model prayer that we find in the gospel account the court is written by St. Matthew in chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus was always glorifying God the Father in heaven the whole time he was here on this earth. This is really something that we need to stop and think about. He always, here he is, about to be arrested. 
And he's glorifying God the Father in heaven. We see that Jesus was given authority over all flesh. Yes, all men belong to God, but not all are given to Christ. But here we see that God gave Christ a special kind of authority over those given to him, the authority to give them what? Eternal life. See, this is part of that pact we talk about. Jesus made a pact with God on how we could be saved, how we could have eternal life with him in heaven. We see here that the gift of eternal life is conditional and available to them alone who are in Jesus Christ, as we also find in other places in the Bible. Think about what we find written in the Bible about Jesus and his special and who he is and what he really is in the Godhead. We find this recorded in the Gospel account is told to us by St. John in chapter 1. We are told, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Wow. Just think about this. It's telling us that Jesus, everything was made for Jesus because He made everything. And he tells us that, how do we get life? In him. Where do we get the light for the light? Life is through Jesus Christ. You see, we know that in Genesis chapter 1, this goes right along with it. Because in Genesis chapter 1, 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, let them have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the, all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Whoa! We know in Genesis it says, God said, let us make man. Let us make man. Us means others were there. So this is before anything was there. So we now have, as we see here, what Jesus says, what did he say? Before the world was, in, in verse 5, this is the us in Genesis. We have the written words of life. So we know and we understand today more than they could back then because we have the complete written word of God that the Godhead, the full Godhead was there upon the creation of the world. We have God the Father, Jesus the Son, and we have the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was there as well. We also find some things about the authority of Jesus in the Gospel account uh, uh, told to us by St. Matthew. And we find in Matthew 28, 18, it's also known and I've heard it's called many times the Great Commission. And we are told that Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever have I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Think about that. All things is what we are commanded to teach. That's why we have the written word of God. So that we can do these things. You know we find in Mark's account of the gospel message. Jesus once again shows his power in life and death. We find it in the gospel account is written by St. Mark chapter 16. In verse 15 it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. The power of life and death through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. One should also now understand that from this, to know God, to know, understand what I'm saying, to know the one and only true living God. There's only one true living God. One has to know Jesus. And it's not just something one can do in passing. You can't just as a casual thing say, oh, I know God. 
Because to know God, you have to know God through Jesus. And it's only done with an extensive, all-embracing, and with profound and deep thoughtfulness for what does it mean to know God? We find it written in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. We're told these words are here for our knowledge. God doesn't just fill this book up with some words to fill it up. They're here for a reason. And he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God, perfect. Hereby know we that we are in him. Thus, without obedience, one may have a few ideals about God, but he does not know God. Let me say that again. You may have, a, without obedience, many people know some things about God. But without obedience and without studying to show thyself approved, without obeying the commandments of Jesus that we have, you don't really know God. The Bible is clear that no one can know God except by knowing Him through Christ Jesus. This means to be united with Christ, to bear His name, to confess Him as Lord, to accept all the obligations entailed by being baptized into Christ. It is written in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Does that not follow us, what we just read there in, in uh, John chapter 1, where it says that in him was life, and the life of the light of men. All through the Bible, it shows us that Jesus is life. Jesus is life, and we need to think about that. But think about this. This is the prayer Jesus has given to God the Father right before they come to take him away. With Jesus prays in the Gospel account of John, chapter 17, verse 6 and 8. It tells us, I manifest thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou givest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out of thee, and they believe that thou didst send me. We see once again that Jesus came to this world to do the will of his Father. Jesus came to this world to do the will of our Father in heaven, the one and true only living God. Jesus, in keeping the word of God in the sense of believing it and obeying it, see, it's not only a question of believing, as Jesus showed us, it's believing in it and obeying it. It was means by which Jesus' disciples had become his and were continued and they continued in that blessed relationship that one will have with God through Jesus when one trusts and obeys the Lord. Jesus came to reveal God's love and his desire for all men to be with him. That's what Jesus came for. He came to show the love of God, how much love God has for people, and that he wants us all to come to him. Remember, it is written... In Psalms 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. The written word, the written word of God, the Bible, is how we light that pathway, that pathway, a straight and narrow pathway that leadeth unto heaven. We find Jesus praying in John 17, verse 9 through 14, Jesus says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are mine. 
For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I glorify in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thy own name thou hast, whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of this world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus, again, they're coming to take him away, and he's praying for the apostles. Jesus is saying that he successfully accomplished the work of God. The work that God had given him when he came to this earth, he did by instructing, and he also was uh, being a uh, correcting and encouraging the twelve. He was praying for them with all his heart, and he was explaining, and he was praying for all those that not only would be lost, except for Judas, as it was foretold. Jesus did the will of God by sharing with the twelve apostles what needed to be done. Jesus is asking God after his departure to protect the apostles who will continue to be the object of Satan's bitter hatred and opposition. You know, think about this, and we see a little bit in the Bible here and there. How much do you think Satan really hated the apostles? How much do you think he went after them? Again, Jesus is about to be arrested, and he knows this. He knows he's going to be beaten. He knows he's going to be whipped. He knows he's going to be nailed to that cross. But his concern now is for the apostles. Now we find Jesus praying in John 17, starting with um, verse 15 through 19. He says, I pray not that thou shalt take them out of the world, but that thou shalt keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Think about this. Jesus is praying to God the Father to keep the apostles in this world, and we should be thankful for this, because he wants them to continue spreading the good news about God. It's a gospel message. And just as Jesus delivered God's word, the apostles, the apostles were also instructed to deliver not their words, but Christ's words, which are God's words. Think about this. We see here, through Jesus talking to God, that not even the apostles had the authority to set up an organization and teach whatever they might want to, or anything they can conceive of, and they can't just go and do whatever they want to do, like we see so much still being done today. The apostles were to use the same commitment and faithfulness in teaching what Jesus had taught them, and show unto them the things God had given unto him, which is in spirit and in truth. You know why this is so important? That the apostles did this right? Why it was so important they continue in the work of God? Where would we be today? Did you ever stop and think about that? Where would we be, where would we be today if the apostles got together and decided to do something different? What if they would have took the money the Jews offered them to deny the Christ? Where will we be today? I thank God for the apostles. 
I thank God for the apostles' doctrine. I thank God we have the written words of life so that we can share this kingdom of God with others. Jesus asked God to keep them from the evil. He couldn't keep them from seeing the evil, but God protected them, I'm sure, as Jesus asked. In John 17, 20, 21, I'm sorry, in John 17, 20, we find Jesus praying. Now listen to this and hear this. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Whoa! Jesus is praying for us. Jesus is about to be arrested, and his concerns are for us. His concerns is for you, and his concerns are for me. Think about that. Jesus is about to be nailed to a cross, and he's more worried about you, he's more worried about me, he's more worried about us than what he's about to suffer. Jesus is about to be nailed to the cross. He's more worried about me. More worried about me than being beaten, being whipped, being spat upon, being nailed to that cross. The love Jesus has for you, the love Jesus has for me is so great, I can't even begin to imagine this. Listen to these words again. He said, neither I pray for thee alone. That means the apostles. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He's talking about the apostles' doctrine. He's talking about Acts. When we read in Acts how one becomes a Christian. Jesus died to make you free. Jesus died to make me free. Hear the prayer of Jesus. He's reaching out to God the Father to save all generations that come to him. All who will believe on Jesus, all who will trust in Jesus, all who will obey Jesus, do through, do so through the words of the apostles. Because there's no other way that faith can be produced. You know, faith comes by hearing. The hearing the word of God. That's how we get faith in Jesus. But why would we think that's strange as being a Christian? You know, the Holy Ghost, the work of the Holy Ghost in the hearts of believers after they are converted and saved should follow exactly the same pattern as was started over 2,000 years ago what we read about in the book of Acts. Amen. It is so amazing to stop and think about that. You know, it's just, it has to be God involved. Through the word, it's not merely an incidental thought, because Peter even tells us. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, he says, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commands of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. We knew the coming of Jesus. Man has known about the coming of Jesus since Genesis, the book of Genesis. Now think about that. We know it today because we can read the whole thing. We, got, we are so fortunate we have the complete written word of God. We can see it from beginning to end. And it's really, really amazing to think about that. But again, here's Jesus in the garden praying so intensely that we know that drops of blood were coming from him. He was praying that intense. But he didn't pray for himself. He was praying for us. Oh, I can't imagine the love that he has. You know, Jesus continues his prayer request. We find in the gospel account of John in verse 17, verse 19, or I'm sorry, in John 17, verse 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou givest me I have given them, 
that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That they may all be one. Wow. You know, when we look around this world and we see all these people telling us all these different ways, how can there be all these different ways if Jesus is praying to the Father for all us to be in one? Amen. It can't be. They, they may all be one. Jesus is praying for Christian uni you, uh, unity. Jesus is praying for Christian's unity. Jesus is about to be arrested. Jesus is about to be beat. He's about to be whipped. He's about to be nailed to a cross. And his whole concern, besides our salvation, is that we follow him and we do it in unity. How important is this? See, so many people, they always want to, eh, God will understand. I, you know, this guy was really dynamic. He really told me all these things. It sounded so good. How important is unity? It's written all throughout the Bible, but Paul lays it out. Brother Paul, the Apostle Paul, you know Paul, the one that was on his way to Damascus to kill a bunch of Christians, became one of the greatest apostles who wrote to the Gentiles? What does Paul tell us in Ephesians chapter 4? In Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 1, Paul says, and this is the attitude we need to have, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where with you are called. We are prisoners of the Lord. We are servants of the Lord. That is a good thing. With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know what Paul's telling you? Paul's telling you, yes, I was not there with Jesus when he went to that cross. Yes, I was one of the ones that persecuted the Christians. Yes, I became an apostle on this side of the cross. But guess what? I still am teaching the same thing the others are teaching. We are one in the Spirit. We are teaching there's only one baptism. We're teaching there's only one Spirit. There's only one Jesus Christ. There's only one God. And there's only one way to heaven. It's exactly what Paul's teaching. We find from Genesis through Revelation, there's only one true living God. So it stands to reason. God's desire for such unity, Jesus' desire for such unity, being immediately started that the world may believe that thou didst send me. You see, we need to teach what Jesus says, not what man says. Because people need to be able to see by reading this Bible, by studying it out, that Jesus was sent by God. And that only through Jesus will one find heaven. The real Christian, the big C Christian, is of God. Not a man. Nothing is more productive of infidelity and unrighteousness than the conflicting doctrines of professions of people who claim to be following Christ because they are not following the apostles' doctrine. They're following man's doctrine. They multiply division. Satan has hindered num numerous millions from obeying the gospel. You realize that? When Satan starts putting division in the Lord's church, he is glorified himself. He is so gleeful because he knows that many, many will never hear the true gospel message. 
No greater need could be imagined than that of the unity of the church of the living God. You know, if you stop and think about what Jesus is saying here, it is so important that we be unified in the teaching of the Lord's Word. It is important that we use the Lord's Word. When we look and we think about this prayer and the unity that the Lord was trying to impose and get us to understand, He wants the same unity with us that is between Jesus and the Father in Heaven. He wants the same unity we all feel and so we have the same unity with Jesus and we have the same unity with God, the one true living God. But Satan has been very busy advocating his own kind of unity. He has a unity of uh, like a dictatorship, of authoritarianism, in which all blindly obey, obey the clergy. They could be the clergy man or clergy woman. We have so many clergy women today. We have so many called priests, so many called ministers, so many called pastors. Where do they call themselves? They're ones who preach not the gospel of God and have the kind of unity that is, we see of a snake and the frog in which one entity swallows up in another. You see, we got to have the unity that Jesus came to this world preached and teach and the apostles have shown us. The unity in which each group of believers accepts his status under some system of allocation in which like the cemetery everyone lies as complacent as possible and does not infringe on his neighbors. That's what we're saying today. You see, oh we can't talk about sin it really upsets a lot of people they won't really like that well, it might be better to point out sin while they're here on earth instead of having to point out to them why they're in hell when they leave this earth. You know, sometimes when people talk about sin and they don't understand how we are associated, when you look at um, 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but Paul basically told these people, you know, you're sitting there letting this man sin. You're not saying a word to him. And you're going to be just as guilty as him who is doing the sin in the eyes of God. So he will get all the pleasure, but you're going to get the same punishment as him because you did not tell him. The unity in which many groups are submerged in a super organization, thus <clears throat> containing every degree of inconsistency and div division under one exaggerated banner, such unity being very similar to that exalted by a barrel of scorpions. You see, true believers in Christ should always yarn for peace, but never for peace at the expense of truth. Unity. See, this is what's wrong in our country today. We have so many people that want to, ah, let's just get along and we'll kind of bend the rules a little bit. And we'll say it's okay for you to be gay. God will understand. Or well, it's okay for you to vote for somebody for abortion. God will understand. No. That's the truth being hurt in God's word. We need to understand that unity means that we are all one in Christ Jesus. That we all understand the word of God. We all believe what is written here. We trust that this is the Word of God. And we are not to change it. We're not to add to it. We're not to take away from it. We are one in the Lord God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> not the apostles only but all Christians partake of the glory of God from Christ. We are the partakers of His holiness like we find in Romans chapter 5. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ 
but whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so doth death pass upon all men, from that all have sinned. We also find this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. We are told, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So how we get this grace and this knowledge? By studying to show thyself approved. A workman, rightly dividing the word of God. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and pre precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of this world through lust. <clears throat> Jesus loves us so much. And we know that. We know he left the splendors of heaven. We know that he came to this world. We know he, all the things he did was for us. He did them for us. All that he put up with. He loved us that much. And he loved us much more than he loved himself by his own actions. He worried about us more than he worried about himself. We find this in the end of his prayer in John 17, 24 through 26. He says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus says, if we love him, the Father will love us. Jesus sealed the deal. You know, in this prayer... And we look at this prayer. Jesus sealed the deal with God. And we know that on that third day, on that third day when Jesus arose from the grave, when Jesus arose from the dead, God accepted Jesus Christ as payment in full for our sins. All who will trust and obey, all who will follow his commandments, all who will go underneath that watery grave and come up a new creature in Christ, all who trust and obey Jesus, he went to that cross and he made a deal with God that he would go to that cross, he would be the perfect sacrifice, he would shed his blood for our sins. Jesus laid out the terms and God accepted them in full. Jesus paid for your sins Jesus paid for my sins with his precious blood. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. It is so sad. So many people really think that the very first thing that Jesus tells us in John 3, he tells Nicodemus, okay, as we just read, Nicodemus said he knows he's from God. And in verse 3, John, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Wow. Why is that so hard? And then we see in verse 5, Jesus says, Very, very, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Why is that so hard to comprehend? And then when we look at the opening day of the church, 
in Acts chapter 2. Again, we know that Acts chapter 2 was the opening day of the church. And we had 12 apostles standing there preaching to over a million people. They were all preaching the same message. And what did they do? We find in verse 32 where they told the people in the audience as Jesus had God raised up, wherefore we are all witness, therefore being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. Until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. All through the Bible we find that God made Jesus Lord and Christ. And here it is. When these people heard this, the first sermon... It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? See, there is something you've got to do. Not come up to the altar. Not go to kneel for a prayer. There's nowhere in the Bible does it say, let Jesus into your heart. This is the answer. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Don't say, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and then you'll be baptized. Don't say anything like that. There is an order to God's plan and we must follow the order. Tonight, we need to understand Jesus is life. The devil, Satan, the evil one is truly death. Jesus says, you must be baptized be saved. And man says, nah, not today. God says these words will never change, and man has changed them. But not the word of God. Man changed his own words. Jesus went to that cross to seal the agreement with God on how one is to be saved. God accepted Jesus on the third day when he arose from the dead. What did man do for you? think about that again everything we read here tonight Jesus was praying to the Father in heaven he knew that they were coming to arrest him he knew that he would stand and be scorned he'd be spat upon he'd be mocked he knew that they would beat him they would whip him to his bones shown and then they would nail him to a cross and he did this, he knew all this while he was praying for you and for me. Wow. What kind of love did Jesus have for us? So let's see the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Tonight, if you're outside of Christ for any reason, why would you be? You know, the, the great thing is, is that when one accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, one goes underneath that watery grave, comes up a new creature in Christ, and we're covered in the blood. We have the blood. And if we sin, we need to go and repent. We need to truly repent, and the blood recovers us. But if you don't have the covering of the blood, what is holding you back? For without the blood, the Lord does not see you. He does not know you. And without the blood, you are a creature of God, but not a child of God. You are a creator, uh, creation of God, but not his child. Wouldn't you rather be a child of God and be part of the inheritance? I'd rather have the inheritance of God than the inheritance of Bill Gates. How about you?